I'm going to begin reading James chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. I'm going to read from the NIV translation. We'll have it on the screens as well, but if you want to follow along, we're in verses 8 through 13. James writes, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now we began this particular study of James chapter 2, and as James does in his letter, we turned our attention to favoritism and partiality in our last teaching. It in, in, in our deep dive, we touched on a few things in part one, like the topic of judging and the topic of faith, but our emphasis was again on favoritism. Now, as you may have picked up in our reading of verses 8 through 12, we will do the same in part two of our study. We will pick up on other topics, but the emphasis is going to be on partiality and favoritism. Now, diving into verse 8, this is a very, very important tie to the preceding verses, 1 through 7, and the proceeding verses, or verse, verse 9. But let's break this down. He begins by saying, if you really keep. Now, remember, James is writing to an audience that had a major problem of failure on the part of many to live what they profess to believe. You might call this hypocrisy. And again, the Christian Jews were in a culture that was heavily influenced by religious people, especially those that were Pharisees, who prided themselves on keeping all of the commands, yet were rebuked by Jesus as being hypocrites. And so he urges his audience, these Christian Jews, to rise above this culture. Now, the law in reference is to love your neighbor as yourself. But before I get to this linchpin, I quickly want to add commentary to the phrase, keep the royal law found in scripture. See, royal law isn't the vernacular that we use in our Christian culture today. We'll say Bible, we'll say scripture, we'll say verses, we'll say passage, but we don't typically refer to it as the royal law. But the choice of words used by James is nuanced. And there are three specific things that I want to point out as to why he uses this language. It distinguishes the law found in scripture as the sovereign rule of God's kingdom. All right, royal language. It, secondly, it indicates the law found in Scripture as carrying the king's authority. And lastly, it refers to the royal rank of this command among the others in law. The whole law, rather than a single command, is intended. But remember, church, Jesus said all the law and the prophets hang on two commandments— And one of them is being cited here by James, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 22. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Again, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Love your neighbor as yourself, James would write. There was an important question once presented to Jesus by an expert in the law. He asked the question, who is my neighbor? It's asked in what we read as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it's found in Luke chapter 10. 
in reply to this question asked, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down this same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, and when I, return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Jesus asked. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, I I love Martin Luther King Jr.'s commentary on this parable, and I want to share it with you. Martin Luther King wrote and said this, who is my neighbor? I do not know his name, says Jesus. He is anyone to whom you prove to be neighborly. He is anyone lying in need of life's roadside. He is neither a Jew nor a Gentile. He is neither a Russian nor an American. He is neither Negro nor white. He is a certain man, any man lying needy on one of the numerous Jericho roads of life. So Jesus ends up defying a neighbor not in defining a neighbor, not in a theological definition, but in a life situation. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I know it says love your neighbor as yourself, but in our context, it is being used in the failure of these Christian Jews to love their neighbor. So this is the emphasis. And to note the type of love to which we should give our neighbor, I want to continue in Martin Luther King Jr.'s commentary. He said, let us notice the good Samaritan possessed the capacity for a dangerous altruism. He risked his life to save a brother. When we use our imagination concerning the reason why the priest and the Levite didn't stop to help the wounded man, numerous things come to mind. Perhaps they were in a hurry to get to an important church meeting for which they could not afford to be late. Perhaps their temple regulations demanded that they not touch any human body for several hours before their temple function began. Or they could have been on their way to a meeting to organize a Jericho Road uh, Improvement Association. Certainly this was a real need. All of these are probable reasons for their failure to stop. But there is another possibility which is often overlooked. It is possible that they were afraid. The Jericho Road was a dangerous road. Some months ago, Mrs. King and I were in Jerusalem. We rented a car and drove down from Jerusalem to Jericho. As we traveled slowly down that meandering road, I said to my wife, I can very easily see why Jesus used this road as the setting For this parable, Jerusalem was uh, some 2,000 feet above sea level, and Jericho was 1,000 feet below it. This upward or downward climb was made in a distance of less than 20 miles. Its many sudden curves made the road conducive for ambushing and exposed the traveler to unforeseen attack. The road came to be known as the Bloody Pass. So it is possible that the priest and the Levite were afraid that if they stopped, they too would be beaten. For couldn't the robbers still be around? Or maybe the man on the ground was just a faker, a faker using a pretended wounded condition to draw passing travelers to his side for quick and easy seizure. So I can imagine that the first question which the priest and the Levite asked was if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Then the good Samaritan came by, and by the very nature of his concern, 
reverse the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? The good Samaritan was willing to engage in a dangerous altruism. In his very life, he raised the question that always emerges from the good man. Another expression of this excessiveness of the Samaritan's altruism was his willingness to go far beyond the call of duty. Not only did he bind up the man's wounds, but he put him on his beast and carried him to an inn. On leaving the inn, he left some money and made it clear that if any other financial needs arose, he would gladly meet them. His love was complete. He could have stopped so much sooner than this and more than fulfilled any possible rule about one's duty to a wounded stranger. He went not only the second, but the third mile. And in our quest to make neighborly love a reality in our lives, we have not only the inspiring example of the Good Samaritan, but we have the magnanimous life of our Christ to guide us. He lived his days in a persistent concern for the welfare of others. His altruism was universal in that he saw all men as brothers. He was a neighbor to the publicans and the sinners. His altruism was willing to travel dangerous roads in that he was willing to relinquish fame, fortune, and even life itself for a cause that he knew was right. Friends, the point in keeping the royal law found in Scripture to love your neighbor as yourself, we are doing right. We are being Christ-like when we love our neighbors as ourselves. But James would open up his next sentence and say, it was in contrast to these Christian Jews' actual behavior as we read in verses 1 through 7. And instead of loving their neighbor, i.e. their poor Christian brothers, they were showing favoritism to the rich. And therefore, the royal law was being broken. And James very clearly states, it is sin. For one stands convicted by the law as a lawbreaker when they show favoritism. Now, this is another contrast used by James, which we have found common in his writing. And it's in your outline, but it says, if you really keep the royal law, you are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you sin. So perhaps James's most important argument against favoritism yet given, he says, in showing favoritism, we violate the law of love and we sin or we break the law to love and we sin. For when we show favoritism to one party, we fail to love our neighbors. And understand this, to transgress the law was a serious rebellion for the Jews and the Jewish Christian. They understood that if you transgress the law, you were therefore under the judgment of God. Very serious. And the point is that loving your neighbor as yourself is the antidote to favoritism and hypocrisy. I'll say it one more time. The point is that loving your neighbor as yourself is the antidote to favoritism and hypocrisy. And church, listen to me. There is no negotiating to this command to love our neighbor. And when we choose to show favoritism, we negotiate the command to love our neighbor. And the commands of God are non-negotiable. James then amplifies his statement with an explanation. He says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Obviously, James is not suggesting that anyone is in reality fulfilling every demand of the law when he says, for whoever keeps the law. He simply puts forth a, okay, suppose it were so assumption. Well, even if it were so, 
and that person were to stumble at even one point to break any commandment, he is guilty of breaking all of it. So James notes that even if one keeps the whole law, but transgresses with respect to a single command, he is guilty. Although the penalties may vary, we are counted as a lawbreaker no matter which particular section of the law we may have broken. And so keeping the law is, of course, and was a very common concept in the Old and also in the New Testaments. And the audience to which he was writing had a very high regard for keeping the law. But it was also common for the religious leaders and the rabbis especially to use the opposing concept of heavier and lighter commands. Let me explain. Every command is important. And James uses this idea of keeping the whole law yet stumbling. He uses this for two reasons. Number one, to skillfully point out an underlying attitude that was in the hearts of his listeners. For often what is revealed in our transgressions is our attitude to a command. For example, blatant rebellion to the command to steal is as if we minimize this command and we prioritize other commands. Or is as if to rebel against the command to not commit adultery. And we put it over here in this category and we minimize it and say, ah, it's not that big of a deal. To take it a step farther to Jesus's commands, he says, you have heard it said you must not commit adultery. But I tell you, if any man were to look at a woman lustfully, he has committed adultery in his heart. And he goes on and he says not to lust. He says not to hate. He says not to lie. See, our sin likely reveals our attitude to the command and perhaps suggests, I don't like it, or it's not that big of a deal, or I don't really care. And our attitude, the attitude of our heart is revealed. Now, there was certainly enough evidence in James's letter that these Christian Jews had an underlying attitude towards this particular command to not show favoritism. So James uses this idea to cut away any grounds anyone may have for a flippant disposition toward the command against partiality. It is not a lesser command, church. See, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, he says, For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, listen to this. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It is also of such importance that In the concluding verses of this passage, James insists that believers will have to account for their actions and their attitudes against the standards of God's law. For this language cites imagery to that of a courtroom. It's like standing before a judge and being judged by the judicial law. It's the example of or the analogy of our judicial laws that we may not have murdered, but maybe we did get a speeding ticket. Either way, we stand as a lawbreaker. And in regards to that of favoritism and loving your neighbor as yourself, will you be found guilty? James goes on and writes, For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. The examples James selects should show just how serious 
of nature his argument is. And not only that, they are very likely far from accidental. He selects the central ethical commands of the Ten Commandments as his examples. And so the order in which he cites them may be significant as well. Upon further study, these two commands come in this order in some manuscripts of the Greek Old Testament and also the Hebrew text. Further, the order appears in some of the same New Testament passages. Some even believe that the reference you shall not commit adultery to have been chosen because of their adultery with wealth to which James would later later write in chapter 4, verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of this world becomes an enemy of God. I, I don't know, perhaps, probably, only its proximity to murder in other sightings is the reason why it's listed this way. It's just one of those things where perhaps it was said in this order so many times by people that he just, you know, recited it as he had heard it. Murder, however, is frequently associated with discrimination against the poor and failure to love our neighbor. And Jesus taught anger is also covered in his reinterpretation of the commandment. You guys remember, Jesus said, you have heard it said this, but I tell you this which is found in Matthew chapter 5. He said that you, he said this, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. James would write later in chapter five, he says, look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. And here's what he says. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Others note James' intentions here to single out people in the Christian community who had been priding themselves on their avoidance of sins of the flesh, i.e. they had not committed adultery, i.e. they had not committed murder, yet all the while they were guilty of sins in their heart. Very interesting observation. But here is the point. As serious as you observe these commands, observe the command to not show favoritism. Getting into point two of verse 11, it begins with this statement, for he who said, James now explains why the law is an indivisible unity. I remember when I was in elementary school, we would cite the Pledge of Allegiance. And we would stand up as a class. Anybody else in here? We would stand up as a class. We would put our hands on our heart and we we would recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I would always butcher the word indivisible. (laughs) Always. Never understood what it meant. But it means unable to be divided or separated. And the laws of God are unable to be divided or separated. Why? Because the commandment is not just a text. It is someone speaking. It is God who is speaking. And if we view the law as a series of individual commandments that are not unified, that are not indivisible unity then we begin to assume that disobedience to a particular command brings guilt only for that commandment. 
This is what is added to verses 9 and 10 from verse 8. But in fact, the individual commandments are part and they are packaged as one unable to be divided or separated because they reflect the will of the one lawgiver. So to violate a commandment is to disobey God himself and consequently make a person guilty before him. Guilty not just of breaking that law, but guilty of sinning against God. So point number two, All the laws and commands of Scripture are from God and is a unity because the lawgiver is one. Additionally, they express his will in each command. And it brings me so much comfort when our pastor has taught us God's commands are more like I love you's. So don't do this or do this. And recognize all crime under the one heading of lawbreaking, for his will is violated no matter which command is broken. So don't treat his commands as some are heavier and some are lighter. We don't have the right to decide which commands are a big deal and which ones are not. They are all important and they all express his will. The concluding verses of this passage speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And then one of my, my favorite phrases of, of all the Bible, mercy triumphs over judgment. The considerations mentioned above lead logically to James's conclusion. Take into account the final judgment. Listen to me. Take into account the final judgment in all of your actions. Speak and act. Again, in our context, this is particularly focused on the discrimination against the poor and on favoritism. But the New Testament has a lot to say about how we speak and how we act. And in this teaching... James says to do so, speak and act in light of the fact that we will be judged on what we say and on what we do. We see him stress the importance of speech elsewhere in his letter. Chapter one, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. You can find us diving into that in our part one series. Then he goes on and says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. You can find in 12 verses, 1 through 12 of chapter 3 talks about reining the tongue. Going into a later chapter, he says, um, he carries similar language into this passage in chapter 4. He says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are keeping, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Lastly, he says in chapter five, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is simple, yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. He expresses and stresses the importance of our actions. He says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This entire chapter on favoritism and on our faith and our deeds. Later chapters talk about fighting and quarreling and even killing. And then the closing chapter talks about self-indulgence and unjust acts. But the concept that one's words and acts will be judged is deeply rooted in scripture. In Matthew chapter 12, 
It says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. Then we have the sobering words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 25. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then, confused, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, listen to me, church. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, these chilling and sobering words, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They too confused will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Sobering. The emphasis on obedience as the criterion in the judgment returns us to the true religion theme from James chapter 1. And it also sets the scene for the closing focus of James chapter 2. True faith seen in works. So with these words, speak and act, James again stresses the need for believers to validate their reality of their religion by doing what the word says. See, God's gracious acceptance of us does not end our obligation to obey him. Rather, it sets us on new footing. No longer is God's law a threatening, confining burden for the will of God now comforts and confronts us as a law that gives freedom. It's an obligation we discharge in the joyful knowledge that God has both liberated us from the penalty of sin and has given us his Holy Spirit to empower us to obey his will. To use James's own description from chapter one, the law is an implanted word written on the heart that has the power to save us. And remember this, liberty does not mean license. License is doing whatever I want to do. And this is the worst kind of bondage, friends, for in it we become slaves to sin rather than slaves to righteousness. Liberty is fulfillment and it's freedom from bondage. It's safety in God's care. It's safety in God's provision. It's safety in God's protection. Have you ever heard of the principle of retribution? The word retribution comes from the Latin and means giving back what's due, which can either be a reward or it could be punishment. In modern usage, it's usually used to refer to punishment. Uh, 
but it's the idea that an evil act should be met with an evil response and force. And it's based on the law of retaliation, but it is in fact what we find in the law recorded in the book of Exodus. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now again, the principle of equal and direct retribution, and this was very popular in the culture of James's day. And so James says, hey, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And very likely James remembered what Jesus had taught him in the parable of the unmerciful servant. Let's read it together. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him in the same words, be patient with me, I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, the point I wish to make is that we ought to be merciful as he is merciful. And in being merciful to others, we reflect the very nature of our heavenly father to them. Now, the Old Testament, of course, repeatedly requires God's people to be merciful to others, especially worth quoting because of the connection between mercy and concern for the poor and powerless. This is what we read um, from the scriptures in the Old Testament. This is what the the Lord Almighty says, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another, Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Jesus taught this in the Beatitudes. He said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. See, I think the greatest understanding of this verse is that it has equal importance to attitude as it does to our actions. The unmerciful servant that we read about refused. It reflected his attitude as much as it did his action. And being merciful also involves actively reaching out to show love to others. The discrimination that James's readers are practicing was in opposition to such mercy. And if they were to continue on this path, they will find at the end of their lives, a judgment that is without mercy. Oh, but thank you, Lord. James does not end this paragraph on this negative note, but with a word of hope. He says, mercy triumphs over judgment. 
though a strict standard is set in conformity to his holy law as the basis of judgment, God is ultimately a God of mercy. And he provides in his grace a means of escaping that judgment. And both Jesus and Paul assured us that Christian believers will never be judged for their sins, but our works will be judged and rewarded. Therefore, think it more likely that James is making a point. The way in which we show mercy toward others shows a heart that has been made right by the work of God's grace. The believer in himself will always deserve God's judgment. We can never say we've been perfect in keeping the royal law as it should be kept. But our merciful attitude and actions will count as evidence of the presence of Christ that is within us. And it is on the basis of this union with the one who perfectly fulfilled the law for us that we have confidence of vindication on the day of judgment. The just for the unjust. God imputed our sinfulness to Jesus when he died on the cross. God raised him from the dead on the third day for our justification. And the righteousness of God is imputed to us so that God can be both, the, can be both just and the justifier for those who put their faith in Christ. And in the face of the judgment that is to come against each and every offense... Mercy, mercy will be greater than judgment. Now, now James is not advocating some kind of legalistic faith. Consistent faith is the core concern of James's teaching. Faith in God in no way causes God to be merciful. Rather, faith is made possible because God is merciful. It is his nature And faith trusts in this merciful God. And faith must conduct itself consistently with God's mercy. In other words, in order to be genuine, a believer's faith must include mercy. For merciful faith exhibits God's mercy towards the poor. And it does not show partiality. I want to close with this parable from Jesus. It's found in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. It says, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much money do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much money do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. The point that I want to make in this parable is the takeaway that God is merciful. The parable begins by giving us two main characters. You have a rich man, later referred to as master. And this rich man was very likely he had business in a state. Furthermore, everything indicates that this rich man was an upright man. And we, gave, we gain evidence from this largely due to two things. The manor, managers clearly labeled as dis, dishonest, yet no breath of criticism is pointed at the rich man. And if the, man, the rich man is anything like the manager's character, he would likely have acted very different than he did in this situation. But what we do not see, 
is this dishonest manager scolded? He's not punished. He's not humiliated. He's not even jailed because of his mismanagement. And later, when the rich man finds out what this manager has done after he was fired, he doesn't become enraged. He doesn't lash out, though he had every right to be. But this rich man obviously cared enough about his reputation and about his clients and about his own wealth that he fired a wasteful and dishonest manager. He didn't simply shrug his shoulders or look the other way, but he fired him. Now, the other main character is the manager, very likely an estate manager who had authority to carry out the business of the estate. And very quickly, it is indicated that he was not an honest manager. And later, such is very clearly stated by the master. But this rich man's servant is called in by the master, having been accused of wasting his possessions. Now, the text doesn't say who ratted him out, but it does let us know that the rich man has heard of his mismanagement, and he is therefore fired on the spot. What's significant in this short uh, recording of this exchange is the manager's silence. You might have expected him to give some type of defense, right? At some point, muster up something to try to make an excuse. Instead, there is nothing offered. And though there is obviously no way to know for sure from this text, I do think that this man's silence to his master's specific question is evidence that he was guilty. Which brings me back to my point that God is merciful. We must understand the audience at this time of Jesus' giving this parable. Verse 1 says that he told the disciples. Verse 14 says the Pharisees who loved money, that's exactly what it says, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this. See, this audience would have been appalled at the manager's response, but even more so, they would have been appalled at the rich man's response. I can't believe this rich man didn't put this manager into prison or at least make him pay back what he took. For both of these options were in this rich man's rights. But no, this rich man is unusually merciful toward the manager. The disciples and the Pharisees would have not missed this upon listening. They would have been blown away by the mercy that was demonstrated by this master in this parable. So understand this about God's nature. He delights in showing mercy. That is, he delights in not giving us what we deserve. Oh, he still judges. He wouldn't be a just God if he didn't do so. But it is his desire for mercy to triumph over judgment. And when he judges, he judges mercifully. And this, my friends, is one of the greatest truths about God's nature.